Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you Daniel J. Morrissey, Professor and Dean Emeritus at Gonzaga University School of Law. Uh, it has taken me about 30 years to get this set up. It's been 30 mm -hmm. years that I've known Dan, and I can't think of anyone that I would rather have come and participate uh, in our celebration of Utopia. Uh, Professor Morrissey has a very distinguished uh, legal career, including service in the SEC's enforcement division, uh, academic positions at deanships at several law schools, and yet he remains a tremendously nice fellow, even having been a dean. I wouldn't go that far. Oh, okay. Uh, he's also written extensively uh, in this area. He has a very interesting, very thoughtful piece from 2001 about uh, Sir, Sir Thomas More and the life of the saint. And he's also taken a look as a, as a natural lawyer at postmodernism of all things. So I think uh, uh, he is prepared uh, for this exercise. But in honor of uh, his coming oh. here, we want to present I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. We wanted to present him uh, with this right. little token of our affection. Me and Tommy Moore. <laughs> Cool. You are now part of Utopia 5. <laughs> Very good. The best Commonwealth has few laws. There you go. That's that no, 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 no. But I will get you the t-shirt oh, yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one here, right? Yeah. There we are. All right. Well, thank you. I'm delighted. So My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the proceedings uh, <laughs> over to Professor Morrissey. And then at the end, we'll have the question and answer. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm delighted to be here uh, at the behest of Professor Malloy, who is uh, a renowned national and international scholar in banking and corporate law, and in addition is someone I know who has always had an interest in the deeper issues of law, jurisprudence, law, and literature. So thank you for having me, Michael. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of my cousin here, Tom Purcell, who has had a... Uh, very distinguished and interesting legal career, which uh, just ended in retirement a few months ago. His last position was here in Sacramento as an attorney uh, for an agency of the state government of California. And uh, Tom's wife can't be here today. Uh, she is the uh, presiding judge of the state bar court. And if you may be familiar with that, in California, there is this high court that deals specifically with appeals from disciplinary actions against lawyers. And Kathy is down in Los Angeles today, I understand, uh, hearing an oral argument on some cases, but she'll join us later tonight, so I'm anxious to see her. And if she were here today, though, I, I know what she would say to a group of young lawyers. She'd give you one piece of advice. Don't mess with your trust accounts. <laughs> All right? <laughs> you don't have to see her in a professional capacity. Yeah, I don't know so again, it's, it's a great honor to be here to speak uh, at this symposium on the 500th anniversary of Sir Thomas More's classic Utopia. And uh, More was from a distinguished family and held a number of government offices in early modern England, going literally from the ground up, starting as London's Commissioner of Water and Sewers. So I think we could use him today in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then he ultimately uh, became the Lord Chancellor of the Realm. In that capacity, he became a confidant to King Henry VIII. War, however, was not only a statesman and a diplomat, but a renowned Renaissance scholar as well. Yet in the end, he was executed by that strong-willed Tudor monarch because he would not take an oath of allegiance to him as the head of the Christian Church in England. The fine British writer Peter Ackroyd, in his biography of Moore, makes a convincing case that Sir Thomas's conscientious defiance was not out of a belief in papal preeminence. Rather, it was a principled stand for the unity of the church and a protest against the erosion of Catholicism's sacramental tradition that makes God's dynamic presence manifest in our lives. More feared that the Reformation fathers worshipped a more remote deity who would ultimately vanish from the world of human concern. God's active benevolence for all was thus the Christian message 
that Moore believed in, one that ins had inspired a deep bond among Jesus' early followers. The Acts of the Apostles describes them as holding all things in common, causing onlookers to remark with admiration how they loved one another. The utopian state that Moore created was situated in a remote part of the New World, and its inhabitants had never heard of Christianity. But when they were told of it by their first European visitors, he says, they eagerly accepted it as most congenial to their way of life. So the aspect of Moore's utopia that prompts my remarks, the fair and equal allocation of goods in his model society, owes its prominence, it seems to me, to the author's deeply held faith. Utopia is a true commonwealth, with the accent on both segments of that compound work. If citizens have little personal property, but they do not have to worry about privation. Instead, the nation's riches are distributed among all who need them. People bring the food they have grown or the goods they have made to the public market, where all the utopians can take what they want without having to pay for it or leave anything in trade. Wholesome meals are freely served to everyone at appointed times in great halls. Families live in similar homes, which they keep in good repair and exchange with one another every 10 years. Moore critically contrasts this communal beneficence to his 16th century England, where people must provide for themselves or go without. But how does Moore's utopia and its bountiful sharing come about? Well, importantly, no one is, there is idle. Every able-bodied person must be productive. Farming and the domestic and the domestication of livestock is a general duty, and individuals who have particular trades and skills use them to serve common need. In addition, no time is wasted making frivolous goods. For instance, citizens wear similar clothing with minor differences for the sexes. The utopians, therefore, have only a six-hour workday, leaving plenty of time for pleasurable pursuits, particularly those that involve intellectual or social interaction or enjoyment of games and the arts. That doesn't sound so bad in comparison to our contemporary culture where anxiety, debt, and overwork seem to be our inescapable lot. Moore may have coined the term, but he has not been the only utopian in history. About a century later, Another famous Englishman of letters, William Shakespeare, was, like Moore, stirred by the founding of the New World to dream up an enchanted island. In one of his most lyrical plays, The Tempest, the bard has a courtier, Gonzalo, deliver a soliloquy promising on his arrival how things would be if he were put in charge. Then there would be, quote, no riches or poverty no occupation, all men idle, and women too, innocent and pure, but nature should bring forth of its own kind all abundance to feed my people. Indeed, what a better place than America to start all over and create a perfect society. Our Puritan founders were people of such noble aspirations. Their first governor, John Winthrop, gave a sermon as their ship, the Arabella, approached Massachusetts Bay, proclaiming that their new state would be a, quote, model of Christian charity, unquote, and a, quote, shining city on a hill, unquote. This high-minded tradition continued into the 19th century when Americans, spurred on by sects like the Shakers and intellectuals like the Transcendentalists, kept experimenting with new formulae for model communities. But our country's best literary effort in this genre of idealized public reform came in the Gilded Age when a Bostonian journalist, Edward Bellamy, wrote his classic Looking Back. In the opening passage, he develops a memorable metaphor for his society as a prodigious coach to which the masses of humanity were harnessed and forced to drag along a very hilly and sandy road. A small number, however, were spared that toil sitting on comfortable seats at the top of the carriage, enjoying a leisurely view unsullied by the dust and sweat below. Yet those privileged few had no compassion for those beneath them who labored strenuously pulling the vehicle along with ropes. 
Then, by a Rip Van Winkle conceit, Bellamy's protagonist falls asleep one night in 1883 and wakes up in the year 2000 to find that the economic structure of Boston and the entire country has totally changed. Gone is the earlier era's exploitation of working people and the industrial strife that went with it. In the early 20th century, America had undergone an economic revolution that rationally and humanely reorganized its productive capacities, paralleling what the country had done politically in 1776. A new sense of patriotism had arisen that freed the nation's capital resources from the holdings of private monopolists and consolidated them under public ownership. Governing boards responsible to the nation itself took control of the company's businesses, and all Americans came to regard it as their duty to give industrial or intellectual service in much the same way that they contributed to its military defense. Correspondingly, the profits of those enterprises came to be shared equally by all the nation's citizens. Bellamy's book became one of the best sellers in the late 19th century, and his ideas engendered considerable enthusiasm helping fuel the populist and progressive surges that drove a good deal of American politics in the early decades of the 20th century. Reformers like the New Dealers continued to develop them in reaction to the vast hardships of the Great Depression. Their approaches to government spawned a regulatory and welfare state geared to making the economic system work for all people, not just an advantaged few. As the generalized prosperity of the post-World War II era began to tail off, reformers revived that approach to deal with the challenges of a stagnant economy. For instance, in the early 1980s, the AFL-CIO proposed a plan to restart America's productive capacities. It would have replaced the country's market-driven economy with a panel of business people, politicians, and union leaders who would direct the revitalization of America's failing industries and the development of new ones. More recent alternatives have appeared as well that have looked to the strong and successful practices of other countries. Among the best of them was Thomas Gagan's Were You Born on the Wrong Continent, which describes how most Americans would be better off if our country's economy were run on the German model, where employee representatives sit on the boards of companies. For instance, the hourly wages and benefits of auto workers there are $56, while their American counterparts make only $33 per hour. Well, we are now 16 years past the millennium, when Bellamy's leading character supposedly looked backwards on the 20th century and saw how America had become an economically just country. And 500 years have passed since Moore spun out his utopian blueprint for a society whose wealth was shared fairly. How are we doing to achieve those lofty goals? The euphemistic answer is not so good. Before I bluntly discuss how growing income inequality and wealth disparities are leading us to a new gilded age, it is good to remember a few things. First, it was not for nothing that Moore named his ideal commonwealth utopia, literally no place in classical Greek. Given the pervasive inequalities and inequities in all human cultures to Moore's day, we might as well ask if his title and the entire work were merely intended as a masterpiece of irony. But let's not forget some wealth-sharing successes that progressives have achieved since Bellamy's day. On the international front, the United Nations has made this ambitious development agenda and has already made substantial progress on a number of these goals. For instance, in the last several decades, poverty in formerly poor countries like China and India has declined markedly because of industrialization. In the U.S., we've made some advances, too. We do have a system guaranteeing some income to our seniors. My father was born in 1914, and he told me that before Social Security was enacted in 1935, there were a lot of older Americans who lived in poverty. Not so much now. Although today's benefits are not a whole lot, you can still live on them, albeit meagerly. And when President George W. Bush proposed after his re-election to make Social Security voluntary, he quickly retreated because of the swift and strong adverse public reaction. In the matter of health care, Medicare, which is as close as we have come to socialism in America, has now been around for 50 years. Its signal successfulness 
was confirmed to me recently by a friend about my age whose father began his career as a heart surgeon in 1964. In his first year of practice, a number of his patients were unable to afford needed procedures, and when they had to have them, they or their families were often bankrupt. But the next year, 1965, Medicare came in, and my friend told me his father's senior patients never had to worry again about the cost of their procedure. As with Social Security, when the Republicans originally talked about cutting back on Medicare benefits, they met a big pushback. It came with this incongruous, angry slogan. Keep the government's hands off my Medicare. <laughs> Go figure. Even many aspects of the much maligned Obamacare have been successes. So much so that the president's arch critic, Donald Trump, while pledging to repeal it, has spoken favorably of the universal health care provided in other countries and has even pledged to replace Obamacare with a system where all citizens will have medical care, medical care paid for by the government. And thanks to food stamps and meal plans for poor children, kids no longer starve in our country, at least not when school is in session. Even Dr. Ben Carson, who is no fan of government assistance, has admitted that his family subsisted on food stamps when he was a boy. One wonders if Dr. Carson weren't nourished by that program, would he have been able to concentrate on his studies and ultimately become a renowned surgeon? Now to the bad news, and there's a lot of it. Income inequality and wealth distribution in the developed world during the 20th and 21st century has followed a U-shaped curve. Such disparity started quite high, but moved down during the decades after World War II. In the last 30 to 40 years, however, it has sharply curved back upward again. There are many studies that document this. Probably the most exhaustive is Thomas Piketty's 2014 book, Capital in the 21st Century. It's quite a tome, but I can sum up his survey of the world's wealth distribution during the last 200 years in a couple of sentences. It's always been a good time to be a capitalist, and the inevitable trend of capitalism is to concentrate wealth in fewer and fewer hands. Pippany found that the generalized prosperity enjoyed by developed nations during the decades after World War II was an historical anomaly. Trade unions were strong then, global competition did not challenge the manufacturing prowess of Western Europe and America, and governments in those countries pursued policies like progressive income taxation that facilitated a more equal distribution of wealth. Since the Reagan-Thatcher era, however, political and economic power have returned to their normal situation of being controlled by a privileged few. On the global scene, the statistics are astounding. 62 individuals now have as much wealth as the bottom half of the world's total population, three and a half billion people. Here at home, a large number of those plutocrats now come from the ranks of cor top corporate executives and financiers. One salient statistic bears that out. In 1965, the CEOs of America's leading companies made about 30 times the income of their average workers. Now that disparity has grown to 300 times more. May I offer a few examples there? Walmart got quite a bit of publicity last year when it announced it would raise its starting wage to $9 per hour. Its CEO, however, makes almost 1,000 times that, $19 million. The CEO of McDonald's in 2014 made $15 million, $15 million. And he got all that without having to fry hamburgers or greet customers with a friendly smile. McDonald's, however, wasn't doing so well, so he was asked to leave. But don't feel too sorry for him. He departed with a $50 million severance package. Another factor figuring prominently into the concentration of wealth is the proliferation of mergers, which in the last year amounted to over $4 trillion globally. A few years ago, I was personally involved with one as a consultant to some unhappy shareholders. It involved the combination of two longtime firms in the tool business that were household words, words, Stanley and Black and & Decker. As is often the case in mergers, the amalgamation of those two companies resulted in redundancies that allowed the surviving firm to eliminate several thousand employees, thus making it more profitable. But the same logic did not apply to the top officials of the two companies. Neither of them was let go. They both stayed on as co-CEOs, 
in that year, one made $30 million and the other made $40 million. All this has occurred at a time when there has been a profound change in the American workforce. Industrial employees are now down to 15% of the labor force, with 80% of Americans in service sector jobs. A small percentage of them are in the highly paid knowledge economy, which includes those in executives and financial positions, but also those in specialized scientific, technical, and professional fields. The high-tech world, however, is not generating a lot of good new jobs. As we lawyers know, computers can now do legal research and medical analysis, too, while journalism and education are also on their way to being automated. Consequently, with robots becoming capable of doing the most sophisticated jobs, many even in highly skilled fields are not seeing their incomes rise. Those with college and postgraduate degrees still make more than less educated workers, as you can see here. Yet, their real income during the last decade has remained flat. Compare that to this chart showing CEO compensation at the nation's top 500 corporations skyrocketing now to over an average of $10 million annually. We are left in this service economy with a bunch of precarious jobs like gardeners, hairstylists, and waiters who serve the tiny minority who really own things and run things. An excellent article in The Atlantic last spring called The End of Work describes how this disturbing phenomenon is playing out in Youngstown, Ohio. When once the steel mills there furnished good-paying, steady jobs to the townspeople, the children of those fortunate post-war industrial workers, now middle-aged themselves, could only get odd jobs which allow them to barely get by. As an alarming corollary to that, a study by the National Academy of Science late last year revealed that the life expectancies of less educated middle-aged whites had been going down due to increased rates of suicide, drug, and alcohol addiction. And with globalization and immigration making Americans compete for jobs with those willing to work for quite less, it is no surprise that politicians like Donald Trump do well advocating protectionist and anti-immigration policies. So how does this all shake out in America today? These pie charts show the percentages of our national riches held by quintiles, each 20% of the population. The one on the right depicts a society with perfect wealth equality, where each one-fifth of the population holds 20% of the nation's riches. How far are we from that? Well, look at the one on the left. The wealthiest one-fifth of Americans hold 84% of the nation's assets. The second quintile, just 11%. The third, only 4%. But what is really stunning are the holdings of the bottom 40% of our fellow citizens. The penultimate quintile owns just 0.2%, one-fifth of 1% 1 of the nation's resources. And that isn't even the lowest category. The bottom fifth of our population has just one-tenth of 1% 1 of our country's wealth. The startling conclusion is that the bottom two-fifths of our people own just three-tenths of 1% of the country's assets. Are other countries like that? No, many are not. Take a look at, the, at one that is a lot better in terms of wealth distribution. The middle pie chart is sweet. As you can see there, the top quintile has only 36% of the nation's wealth, as opposed to 84% in our country. And the middle three tiers are close to where they should be, at 21, 18, and 15%. Even the bottom quintile has some economic resources. 11% of Sweden's wealth, as opposed to one-tenth of 1% 1 in our country. On the income side, as we've said, ordinary Americans continue to slide downward, and the Great Recession that began in 2008 has contributed heavily to that. But despite talk of an economic recovery, the average American household no, now has $4,000 less in income than before that recent recession, down from 56,000 to 52,000.
This is quite a bit less in real terms than at the end of the last century, and it bears out the grim description I've given you of the ominous trends in our economy. Throw into this mix the stark situation that most older Americans face in their retirement. As we've said, Social Security isn't much, but at least it's something, because few Americans have a traditional defined benefits pension anymore. Those have been replaced by self-funded ones, the so-called 401k plans. But in those, the average American over 60 has only $100,000 that must last her for probably several more decades of her life. And 30% of Americans over 60 have no retirement savings at all. On the other side of the life cycle, the situation is just as bleak with the mountains of student debt that many young people carry. I don't have to tell you about that burden, which may well restrict the opportunities of 20 and 30-somethings for many decades to come. It is true, however, that Americans have historically tolerated large disparities in wealth and income. Our country was so bountiful that most believe that if they worked hard, they, or at least their children, well, they would have a better life. That's been the American dream. But studies show that as most folks have become aware of these unfavorable trends, such optimism has become harder to sustain. In the same vein, studies now show there is less upward mobility in America today than in countries like Britain and France that have historically had much more stratified societies. Reversing these pernicious tendencies from a practical point of view would require initiatives like a higher minimum wage, a stronger social safety net of housing, health, and educational subsidies, and a progressive income tax to pay for those benefits. It might even necessitate a guaranteed national income. For details on all that, I would refer you to the webpage of presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. Yet, as a professor of business law, let me point out another approach that would complement such measures and perhaps be even more workable. For several decades, the cause of corporate social responsibility has been growing into a large-scale movement. It would charge the leaders of America's 7,000 public companies, which hold the lion's share of our country's resources, to use them not just to make profit for their shareholders, but also for the larger interests of society, paying their workers good wages, serving the communities where they do business and safeguarding the sustainability of our environment. Over a century ago, Henry Ford espoused that enlightened view when he raised his auto workers' base pay to $5 per day from the then prevailing wage of $2. When challenged by shareholders who claimed that his business policies were too philanthropic, he defended them with this statement. Quote, my ambition is to employ still more men to spread the benefits of this industrial system to the greatest possible number, to help them build up their lives and their homes. To do this, we are putting the greatest share of our profits back into the business. Ford didn't win that fight, but he did set a standard that should be the norm today. The Securities and Exchange Commission, which has the statutory authority to mandate disclosures from public companies, should exercise its power toward that end. It ought to compel those businesses to state in their public filings as many firms now voluntarily do, the policies they have adopted to further the larger social and economic interests of society. Just as the disclosure of pro bono activity that many state bars mandate from their lawyers encourages such beneficial activity in our profession, such required corporate reporting would likewise spur large business to do the good work that many now expect from them. If that exercise of soft power fails to generate a universal corporate culture of social responsibility, the law could order that standards compelling such behavior be set. They could then be enforced by an audit process similar to what is now required for the financial statements of public companies. American liberalism has advanced ample justification for such progressive programs. Perhaps the best was formulated by the political philosopher John Rawls. He set up a thought experiment where everyone would start out behind what he called the veil of ignorance, unaware of how fortunate or hapless their state in life would be. Anyone, therefore, could find herself in an ill-fated situation when she left this original position. With such uncertainty about one's lot in life, Rawls posited that everyone would only assent to a social contract where no inequalities would be allowed 
unless they benefited the least advantage. In other words, it seems Rawls was using self-interest to justify his consensus mm -hmm. utopia. If people didn't know the situations they would be born into, they would hedge their bets by agreeing only to a social order where everyone was treated fairly. Yet Rawls' ultimate motive may have been more altruistic, to set up a universal community of empathy in line with Kant's categorical imperative and the golden rule, where everyone would feel a bond with others, particularly those who do not enjoy a privileged position. Going back to religion, what might again find roots for all that in what we call biblical socialism, ideas found not only in the Hebrew and scripture and Christian scriptures, but in the teachings of other great faiths as well. At core, they all seem to understand that there is something so deeply meaningful about caring for others that we might even understand it as a divine mandate. This, I believe, is what moved Moore to create his commonwealth of love. His personal story, however, does not have a happy ending, at least in the short term. Henry VIII brooked no dissent from his absolute authority. So while mounting the scaffold at the Tower of London, Sir Thomas, ever a man of good humor, shared several wisecracks with his executioner. But it was perhaps his utopian vision of human fulfillment that Moore finally had in mind as he knelt there and declared, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. Thank you very much. Will you entertain questions? <laughs> sure. Or comments. This might be more appropriate. We'd like to go first. Yeah. yeah how long is it with capital in the 20th century? It's a poem. It's about six, seven hundred pages. But I found it to be fascinating because it talks about how, you know, we humans had to make this transition from about two hundred some years ago when we almost almost all of us lived off the land. You know? And then we had the Industrial Revolution and uh, there was all kinds of strife during the 19th century that Bellamy's book describes and how that ended up in our country. And uh, he saw a happy ending. And, uh, but we, I think, to some extent avoided that because the philosophers, economic philosophers like John Marion Keynes in the 30s, who everybody kind of bought into was saying the government should have a role to guide all this. And then we had this great prosperity after World War II, which uh, Piketty's a Frenchman, so he calls this the Le Tronc Laureate. 30 great years. And we had, you know, uh, pretty generalized prosperity. And it was, uh, I grew up in Chicago and it was a great time when everybody had some money. You could find I have, Tom and I have cousins in London and I was visiting with them and they talked about the 1960s when it was really easy to get a job there and things. And then we took a turn the other way and uh, the, the trend has been in the last 30 some years. So that's where we are today, and we talked a lot actually in the earlier one about revolution and each generation. I, I, maybe I can just add a comment from my son, who's uh, 24, 25 years old. He's gearing up to go to med school, but he called me. He's very excited about Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders. He says, Dad, you know, how can my generation be excited about this current economic system when it leaves us heavily in debt and without jobs? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what do you expect? What do you expect us to do? Somebody who's kind of status quo oriented, you know, so. And then on the other side, you know, I talked about the other side too, the folks of my generation. Retirement, so, uh, forgive me. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, uh, on the notion of debt and how a capitalistic society seems to be so much dependent on debt, even uh, not just on the on mainstream and consumer level, but also uh, in, in any corpus resolution. and. Uh, as we saw the crisis of 08, the first thing was to increase debt rather than to accept right. losses. And, and so if, if, uh, David uh, Graeber in his book, uh, 5,000 Years of Debt, he speaks about how debt actually is a uh, instrument to people in medieval years and even, even backwards used debt as basically to collateralize people. And they use people as slaves. And how we, uh, in a maybe pretextual kind of way, have, by taking people's assets and, take, and uh, yeah. taking people's homes, 
we actually, in effect, are doing the same thing. And the, uh, the charts you've shown. Uh, well, uh, those are all wonderful. I think, but even on the other side, I mean, you know, traditional wisdom, our, our conservative family is just to say, stay out of debt. You know, it's always a good philosophy. But, but even Marx says that a little bit of debt can be a good thing. Yeah. And, you know, consumer debt, consumer spending has driven the economy. And, but the whole question is, you know, <laughs> keeping it in proportion to what you're making and your ability to pay it off. And we get into housing bubbles where everybody thinks that the collateral is going to continue to rise in value. And, you know, that's when the whole thing collapses. So, uh, so right now, we, you're right. I mean, people are burdened by these huge jets and things like, uh, you know, student loans are now not dischargeable in bankruptcy, you know, which is, I mean, is that good for you? you know, of course it isn't. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, not good. So, I mean, I don't get too political here, right? I might say one thing. I was thinking, uh, too, about utopia. The downside of all this, and as you can see, I'm kind of a fan of utopian societies and all that. But I used to teach this in Miami, Florida, and uh, we were talking about this earlier novel, which we were with uh, communist society, and some of my students would point out, oh yeah, there's a little place uh, about 90 miles south of here, <laughs> which <laughs> it sounds a lot like what Moore is describing here. It's a very drab, where everybody gets has to go out and work the land, and you know, it's uh, there's no fun, and no, no, not much freedom. And so, you know, there's the, uh, I, had, I had to throw that in, because you guys were kind of leading up to that, so all your discussions about the, uh, the communist society and beating us up. Well, to uh, point out the other side here, uh, you know, the system, if it works, I, mean, I don't consider myself a socialist, but I mean, I think you have to, as we were saying earlier, you have to have some incentives for people. And, you know, these utopians, Bellamy and more, they, I mean, the obvious critique is that they presume a certain type of human nature where everybody's going to go in and pull their weight and uh, do, everybody should just work out of a sense of common good and, you know, shit. And that's a, that is a certain view of people that uh, doesn't seem to be borne out, at least by some, some people. Are. You know, you have some people like that, for sure. So, uh, how do you deal with <laughs> to this book that I was talking about, that maybe it's not so bad if we end up having machines doing all the work, if in fact we all own the machines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and therefore we can do some interesting stuff with our lives, uh, or if we have work that we totally enjoy, I think Mike is doing, and I like what I'm doing, and you know, I mean, I would hope. Uh, I try not to tell them that. <laughs> I don't want them to think. A lot of industrial work became drudgery, and a lot of law work, you know, and let me tell you a little secret about law, you know, it has its exciting moments, but uh, sometimes it's very tedious and stressful on things too, so I mean, you, but uh, so work can be very satisfying, and, and even, you know, idealists like Marx used to say people ought to work out of a sense of inner need and fulfillment, you know, I'm not one who wants to retire, I mean, I like to always be doing something, and we were talking about friends who have retired, and a lot of them are my old friends, they're doing stuff like some of them are acting in plays and some of them are learning Chinese. And I mean, they're, they're going in a variety of ways of self-fulfillment, uh, doing a lot of volunteer work and all these things. If you're financially set, that you can go off and... Uh, and, and they feel the need to do it. Oh, very much so. You know, it's not right. just, well, let me go see. They, they feel unfulfilled without it. Right. And, uh, I think the deepest... You know, that's why I got a little metaphysical there at the end, but the, the, the deepest idea is, you know, how do we reach human fulfillment? We were talking about happiness. And, and do we reach fulfillment alone, or do we do we have this joy of actually helping others? And that's that great religious insight, you know, which almost, you know, seems like it came from God. Uh, some will say it does, but it, it almost kind of is built into us, right? Or it is we like nature. To help. I mean, I mean, we were talking about yeah. this uh, earlier on. Yeah. I, mean, I think... Aristotle's great insight, which people usually dismiss as kind of a truism, this notion that uh, 
to be human is to be a social creature. I, I think that's not just about we like their hunting packs. I think it's there is something fundamentally satisfying for us to have our interactions. Um, and that's part of us. Yeah, Mike, let me also uh, say, uh, I don't like, but talking about the work, you know, surveys that are done are the work of lawyers, too. And uh, the, the lawyers that like to, to do public interest work, work with small firms, and do work with individual people, find it more satisfying many times. The lawyers that work in big firms, and, you know, they've got the big financing deal they're working for, but and they make more money, but as far as joy and fulfillment, you find the lawyers who do the family law and small clients and things uh, do find it to be more satisfying, too, would you say? Have you guys seen studies like that? So, well, I find it more joy. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so they're not too, too. Not that you can't find some satisfaction as a business lawyer, because I think if you're helping businesses do financing and they can hire people and things like that, you know, it can be satisfying, too. And so. the intellectual puzzles of it. Are really fascinating. Yeah. But I think there you, you do need something beyond that. Yeah. Wow. So Money's not enough. But uh, well, I think that's, the, that's oh. something that I thought of. You mentioned the American dream and doing better to my or doing well to my kids and do well. My parents didn't go to college and I'm sitting here in law school. And so I feel like the American dream doesn't necessarily need to be defined by how much money you have or how much money your kids make or how well they live. It's they helped me live my dream. They didn't get to. My mom apparently, I knew this about her, wanted to be uh, uh, a flight attendant. But you know, she, she worked hard, but now I'm in law school. And so I wrote down this question of like, what does it mean to have, like, how do kids live that American dream that we wanted them to live? And is it upward mobility, like you mentioned? Is it financial success? Or is it just them living what they want to do? Yeah, I'm in tons of debt, but my parents helped me get to where I am and that, you know, so it's kind of that thing of, it's not just about the money, um, they won't get me, they have a will be, so, uh, but I'm happy, and I think that makes them happy. There is a hierarchy of needs. <laughs> well, it's yes, like financially it would be nice to be a little more. <laughs> no, but I, 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 this is a dispute we have in our family, which I probably shouldn't reveal, but um, in an unguarded moment, um, someone asked me, well, what, what, do you, what would you really want for your children? And I said, I want them to feel like they have the freedom to do whatever excites them. And whatever that is, I will just be so excited about it. You know, if they wanted to be uh, a mason, the, the kind of built some bricks, not the yeah. secret society. <laughs> they wanted to be a mason, and they were they found the satisfaction in that. Mm -hmm. That would thrill me. And my wife explained to me that that was not something we were going to repeat to the children <laughs> because she expected them to make that advance. Now, she's first generation here. Mm -hmm. I'm second. And the difference is we start with certain expectations, mm -hmm. but it's all in a one sort of movement uh, with greater dreams, with broader horizons, with further... Uh, goals uh, often ahead, mm -hmm. and I think you reach a point where you can, the search for happiness expands, mm -hmm. and it goes in other directions. And to this day, I still feel the same way, but I don't, don't say anything about that. My dad told me if I wanted to flip burgers for a living, and I was happy doing it, he would support me. I don't believe that for him, for all things in China, <laughs> but the fact that he said that is, so, so I, I agree, it's, it's that happiness whatever defines my happiness is their yeah. happiness kind of a thing. I think it's interesting too. I noticed in college, I was first generation in college, and I had a lot of friends who went to a private college, and um, there's a lot of wealthy people there, and a lot of people that came from wealthy backgrounds who had very successful parents didn't do as well and didn't finish. So I think it's, it's interesting to see how people do based on where they come from, and I don't know. Oh yeah, I think uh, yeah. your family is working. Mm -hmm. It's often about expectation. Yeah, I think parents that put maybe more pressure on, you know, kids. Like I had a friend who parents were doctors, both of them, and finishing college was a real struggle for her. But 
I think it's fair to say that you have to take away from this that more in that book have a, an almost scary relevance to us today. And you know, for a book that's 500 years old, that that's extraordinary. How would you how would you play that out in the, the development? The, uh, well, it it certainly seems to be at the very least a credit. To his his intellect and vision. On the other hand, it may also mean that we are in a very depressed society when the best uh, inspiration we can gain is from a black hundred years old. <laughs> you know, have we got? Have we learned nothing else? <laughs> and I really like the idea in there that people don't have to work too hard. I mean, yeah. and they can devote time to other self-fulfilling activities. Yeah. Which yeah. We just need to be going worse and worse. Um, no, that's true. And there's no lazy people. That was also, I mean, uh, everyone, yeah. that was what made it work, though, was everyone pitched in. Everyone yeah. pitched in. Every contributed their one million. Yeah. Yeah. And if they didn't, they were re educated. That's, yeah. Now that's I don't want to go back to law school or even think about it. Unless it's kind of bothersome. Because how do you get them all to act that way? I guess that's the point. Uh, And, and even if you assume the best intentions, there's still going to be fierce disagreement about what that should be. Yeah. So. And in a system, almost for bowing, bowing to our mechanical overlords, you know, in a system where machines do everything for us, you could theoretically see that, but then people might take more of the machines. Or, you know, people, I guess, there's going to be time is coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.